John Reginald Halliday Christie was born on April 8th, 1899, in Northerham, the West Riding of Yorkshire, England, to parents Ernest John Christie, a carpet designer, and his wife, Mary Hannah Halliday Christie, the daughter of a local businessman and liberal counsellor. The Christies had seven children between them, with John, more commonly known as Reg, being the second youngest. Reg didn't have a good relationship with his father growing up. Ernest was very involved in helping the local community, but was extremely strict and abusive towards his children behind closed doors, getting them into trouble for minor incidents. Reg's relationship with his mother and sisters was also somewhat strained. They bullied him a lot, and although this was a common occurrence, Reg claimed that he adored his mother regardless, and it was clear to his other siblings that Reg was her favourite child. Reg grew up in Halifax before moving to West Riding. He was an extremely intelligent child with an IQ of around 128 at just age 11. As a result, he was given a scholarship to Halifax Secondary School where he performed excellently, especially in woodwork, history and mathematics. Despite being very clever, Reg was not a very sociable child. He was very quiet and kept himself to himself, described by his peers as, quote, a queer lad. Outside of school, Reg was involved in the Boy Scouts, the church choir and a local drama group. He left school in 1913, where he became an assistant cinema projectionist at Commodore Cinema in Hammersmith. One of the significant events in Reg Christie's young life which contributed to the shaping of his murderous future was when his maternal grandfather David passed away in March of 1911 at the Christie residence on Chester Road, Acroydon. It was at this point that 11-year-old Reg saw the dead body of his grandfather in an open coffin in the funeral parlour, and this visit made a lasting impression on him. He became fascinated by the corpse lying in front of him, and claimed to feel a sense of power and well-being looking at it. Reg also rather disturbingly began to play in the graveyard and was fascinated with the broken vault that housed the children's coffins. He claimed to have enjoyed looking through the cracks of the vault. He was, by all accounts, a morbidly curious young boy. By 1917, Reg had enlisted in the army and was called up a few weeks prior to his 18th birthday, becoming an infantryman on the 52nd Nottingham and Derbyshire Regiment. In June of 1918, Christie was serving in the Duke of Wellington Regiment as a signalman in France, but he was injured in a gas attack. As a result, Reg was sent to a hospital in Calais, where he remained for around a month for treatment before returning to his duties. At this point, Christie claimed to have lost his voice and sight for around three years following the attack, which resulted in his voice becoming somewhat of a whisper for the remainder of his lifetime. Rather interestingly, his alleged blindness was never on any hospital records, and interestingly enough, according to Scottish journalist Lodovic Kennedy, if Reg had become mute, he wouldn't have been declared fit to return to the army. Reg was known by many to exaggerate due to an underlying personality disorder as a way to get attention, something which he craved, having had such an isolated and lonely childhood. 
Whenever he was in an uncomfortable situation, he would always exaggerate illness, especially after he was hit by a vehicle shortly after moving to London in 1934. It was well known that Reg visited the doctor an excessive number of times. A year after he was demobilised from the army, Reg married a woman from Sheffield named Ethel Simpson Waddington and the two moved to the Sheffield area. Unfortunately, Ethel suffered a miscarriage not long after the pair were married and something which significantly strained their relationship was the fact that sex was something Reg struggled with in his adolescence and for the remainder of his life. He suffered from erectile dysfunction. He was teased relentlessly about this by his peers and was given a number of cruel nicknames. He was never able to perform unless he was with prostitutes, as he had full control over them. After four years, Reg and Ethel separated, and by this point, Reg went to live in London, whilst Ethel remained in her hometown of Sheffield, where she gained employment as a typist. Over the next decade or so, this was when Reg Christie started having run-ins with the law, resulting in a number of short prison sentences. Most of the offences committed were petty crimes. However, one crime against a prostitute was labelled a, quote, murderous attack. In April of 1921, Reg was given three months in jail for stealing postal orders whilst he worked as a postman. In September 1924, he was given a nine-month sentence at Uxbridge Jail for theft. In May 1929, a further six months of hard labour for striking a prostitute named Maud Cole on the head with a cricket bat whilst living in Battersea, where Christie was working as a lorry driver, and in 1933, he was given another three-month jail term for stealing a car from a priest. Reg was released in January of 1934, and it was at this point that he reconciled with his wife, Ethel. Following their reunion, and despite the fact that Reg still regularly visited prostitutes, the couple moved into a top-floor flat at 10 Rillington Place, a three-storey brick-end terrace located in Notting Hill, London, alongside their two pets, a cat and a dog. They moved into the property in 1937, but moved downstairs to the ground-floor flat in December of 1938. Each flat at the property had a bedroom, kitchen and a living room, but the tenants had to share an outside bathroom as there were none in the building. It was built in the 1870s. 10 Rillington Place was located very near to the Metropolitan Railway line, so the constant noise of trains would have been extremely loud for those who lived in the building. By this point, World War II had begun, and having left his job as a foreman at the Commodore Cinema in Hammersmith, Christie joined the War Reserve Police, a job he adored due to the fact he had authority over people, especially women. Authorities actually failed to do a background check on Christie, not looking at his previous criminal record and convictions, so they accepted him into the force without batting an eye. Christie was sent to work at Harrow Road Police Station. It was here he met a woman named Gladys Jones, with whom he began having a five-year affair with. Gladys's partner had actually been serving in the army for the duration of the Second World War, and upon his return, he discovered the affair. This resulted in him going to Gladys's house, where Reg Christie was, and subsequently assaulted him. After this incident, Christie only ever invited women to his home. He never went to theirs. During his time with the police, Reg used his position of authority very much to his advantage. He commonly followed women and kept notes about them. He even watched his neighbours regularly through a peephole in his kitchen. 
By 1943, Reg Christie committed his first killing, a murder spree which would span over a decade, resulting in at least eight people dead. Christie's modus operandi in these murders was gassing the victim before strangling them to death. Sometimes he would then carry out acts of necrophilia on the victim's corpses. The first murder occurred on the 24th of August 1943 when Christie's wife Ethel was out of town. The first victim was an Austrian refugee named Ruth Marguerite Christine Furst, a 21-year-old waitress and munitions worker. Despite working at two jobs, the pay wasn't great, so Ruth partook in prostitution on the side to make ends meet. She did have a child by a Cypriot, however, she gave up the child for adoption. Christie and Furst met at a snack bar in the locality. This was where Furst met some of her clients. Christie invited Furst back to his apartment to have sexual relations, and following this, he impulsively strangled her in the bed with some rope, asphyxiating her and eventually killing her. After Ruth died, Reg hid her remains underneath the living room floorboards, but after one night, he then decided to move her body and subsequently buried her in the back garden. Not long after the murder, Reg left his post at the police station and found a job as a clerk at a radio factory. It was there that he met 32-year-old Muriel Amelia Eady his second victim. In October of 1944, Christie took Edie back to Rillington Place, having told her that he had made a, quote, special mixture that could help cure her chronic bronchitis. Christie told Muriel that she had to inhale the mixture from a jar with a tube inserted into the top. The mixture was actually something called Friar's Balsam, also known as a tincture of benzoin, which Christie used to disguise the smell of domestic coal gas. At this point in the 1940s, coal gas was 15% carbon monoxide. Muriel sat on the chair and inhaled the special mixture. However, when her back was turned, Reg put another tube into the jar, which was actually connected to a gas tap. So Edie was breathing in the gas and as a result, soon fell unconscious. Reg subsequently choked her, carried out acts of necrophilia on her dead body and buried her in the back garden next to where he had buried Ruth first. Husband and wife of a year, 24-year-old Timothy Evans from South Wales and 19-year-old Beryl Thorley moved into the top floor flat at Rillington Place in April of 1948, the flat Reg was previously occupier for. In October of that same year, the couple welcomed their first child, a daughter named Geraldine. In November the following year, Beryl fell pregnant again, but she was extremely concerned about it because the pair really struggled to support one child, let alone two. Timothy couldn't read and only had a job as a van driver, which didn't pay well. This put a strain on their marriage. As a result, Reg told Beryl that he could carry out an abortion for her, even though it was illegal at the time and her husband, Tim, was completely against the idea. The two got into a physical confrontation regarding the matter. The following day, November 8th, Beryl visited her downstairs neighbour for the procedure to be carried out. However, Reg Christie gassed her, strangled her, and proceeded to rape her post-mortem. He then hid her body. 
When Timothy returned from work later that night, Reg told him that Beryl had died during their procedure and that they had to hide her body to cover their tracks so that they couldn't be charged with manslaughter. Christy actually managed to convince Timothy to visit relatives in Wales and to leave his young daughter with Reg to give to a couple desperate for a child in order to divert suspicion by telling relatives that Beryl and Geraldine were away on holiday. However, whenever Timothy came by to ask about his daughter, Reg refused to tell him how she was doing. As a matter of fact, Christy had hidden both Beryl and Geraldine's bodies in an upstairs flat, which was vacant, due to construction work being carried out on the building at the time. On December 2nd, 1949, the bodies of Beryl Evans, Geraldine Evans and a 16-week male fetus were found behind a sink and under wood by the door in the wash house, located outside in the back garden. Christie moved their remains after the carpenters finished their work. Both Beryl and Geraldine had been strangled, Beryl with a rope and Geraldine with a tie, and Beryl was assaulted prior to her death about three weeks prior, and yet no reports of any unusual odours caused by decomposition was reported by workmen or residents of 10 Rillington Place. Not even the Christie's dog acted out of sorts. Interestingly, the pathologist couldn't find any evidence a pill was taken to abort the child. Beryl did, however, have vaginal bruising. However, the medical examiner refused to take a semen sample for reasons unknown. What should be noted here is that none of Christie's previous victims were found at this point. Authorities overlooked the fact that there could have been more bodies buried in the back garden. They only ever examined the garden, albeit not very well. A human femur bone was propped up against a fence and it was missed and even the Christie's dog dug up Muriel Edie's skull, which once again police missed. Christie actually threw the skull into a nearby house which had been recently bombed. It was later found. If they had been more competent during their searches, perhaps police would have caught Reg Christie sooner. If they had, more than five innocent lives could have been spared, including that of Timothy Evans. On the 30th of November, days before the bodies were found, Timothy Evans went to police, riddled with guilt, and told them that his wife was dead. He claimed to have given Beryl a bottle of something, he didn't know what it was, that a stranger, later named as Reg Christie, had given him to help abort their unborn child. However, the process went wrong and he disposed of her body in the outside drain. He later changed his statement and told police that Reg Christie helped move the body upstairs to the vacant flat, but that Reg had thrown Beryl's body into the sewer drain. But no body was found, and the manhole cover needed at least three people to open it. Timothy clearly didn't actually know where his wife's body was, which suggested that his confession was fabricated by police, as there was a number of loopholes in his supposed story. Timothy then told authorities that he had given baby Geraldine to Reg Christie to care for her, and subsequently left for Wales. Timothy's confession didn't seem to be genuine. Much of it didn't sound like it came from the man himself. Several words and expressions throughout being out of place. Timothy wasn't a very intelligent man. He had an IQ of around 70, so many of the expressions in this statement were far too advanced for him to know. Also, Timothy's flat was searched and what was found was confusing. There was a stolen briefcase and papers scattered everywhere, including a newspaper clipping regarding the torso murder. Apparently, authorities forgot that Timothy could not read. It appeared as if the so-called evidence had been planted there. Also in Evans' confession, several other details didn't match up. 
He claimed to have locked the wash house, which simply had not been the case, as workmen were coming in and out at all hours of the day. He claimed to have left Geraldine alone for two days following the murder, however, no cries of a child were reportedly heard. Apparently, Timothy did not know his 18-month-old daughter was dead until police at Notting Hill Police Station asked him about her clothes. He then broke down and was subsequently tricked into giving a false confession whilst in an emotionally fragile state. Timothy actually withdrew his confession shortly after he was charged and continued to blame Reg Christie for the murders of his wife and daughter, as Christie was the very last person to see them both alive. Police seriously mishandled their investigation into Timothy Evans. They apparently showed him the clothes belonging to Beryl and Geraldine and told him that they were found in the wash house. When conducting murder investigations, it's important for the killer to admit where the bodies are hidden to confirm that this individual did indeed commit the crime, but the police blatantly told Timothy where the bodies already were. When Timothy was initially brought in for questioning, he thought that it was in regard to the stolen briefcase in his apartment, not the murders of his wife and daughter. On the 11th of January 1950, Timothy Evans went to trial for the murder of his daughter Geraldine. However, the prosecution did not pursue a second murder charge for Beryl's death. He was charged in relation to both deaths at this point, however. Geraldine's case seemed to be the most important to go forward with due to lack of any motive. Evans, of course, denied murdering his daughter. The defence severely let Tim Evans down. They didn't even investigate his version of events, seemingly having already made their minds up that he was guilty. They failed to question any witnesses. Reg Christie was surprisingly a principal witness for the Crown at the two-day trial, even though Timothy told authorities that Christie was involved in Beryl's death. It is believed that the Crown saw the reserve policeman as one of their own and genuinely treated his testimonies as gospel. Christie denied the accusations against him and told the courts about numerous arguments Timothy and Beryl had in the months leading up to her death. He even claimed that the tie found around Geraldine's neck belonged to Evans, something which was later disproven. It belonged to a Mr Kitchener, the occupier of the vacant flat upstairs, who at the time of the Evans murders was in hospital for five weeks. Reg had clearly taken it and used it to kill Geraldine. Despite the fact that Reg's criminal record came to light, resulting in his termination at the post office where he worked, the jury found Timothy Evans guilty after only 40 minutes of deliberations. Timothy was far from perfect. He did have a bad temper and a number of fights with his wife. He was also known to be a fantasist, making up extraordinary lies such as his father being an Italian count, and he drank heavily, all of which were used against him at his trial. But he never had any previous criminal convictions. An appeal was launched in an effort to prove his innocence. However, Timothy Evans was taken to the gallows at Pentonville Prison on the 9th of March 1950, where he was hanged as an innocent man. Reg Christie spent the next three years laying low, but managed to find work as a clerk with the British Road Services. At the same time, new tenants arrived at Rillington Place, including West Indies immigrants. The Christies didn't like them, and at one point it was reported that Ethel was assaulted by one of their new neighbours. However, Reg managed to keep the back garden of the property to himself. Reg and Ethel's relationship hit a rocky patch once again when she suggested that the couple move. She was annoyed about sharing an outhouse with the immigrants and continued to ridicule her husband about his impotence. Reg became annoyed with Ethel's constant nagging and to make matters worse, he quit his job and told them that he had found a better one. 
but he had nothing lined up. He was staying at home. On December 14th, 1952, Reg Christie struck again, but even closer to home. That morning, he strangled his wife Ethel in bed and buried her remains under the parlour floorboards. Christie explained her noted absence to a number of friends and family. However, his story regarding Ethel's whereabouts were all different. He told one that she was in Manchester, another Sheffield, and seemed in fine fettle in the few days prior to her disappearance. Shortly beforehand, Reg had quit his job and went on unemployment benefits. As a result of little money to his name, he sold much of Ethel's jewellery, including her wedding ring, watch and even some furniture. Something extremely telling was the fact that on January 26th, 1953, Christie forged Ethel's signature and managed to withdraw all of the money from her bank account. Come Christmas, Reg even continued to send cards from Ethel and Reg, making it appear as if Ethel was still alive and well. However, Ethel's murder wasn't Christie's last. In early 1953, three more women became victims to Reg Christie. In February, a prostitute named Kathleen Maloney. On January 19th, Rita Nelson, a pregnant woman visiting from Belfast. And on March 6th, Hectorina McLennan, a Scottish woman who was living in London at the time with her boyfriend. Christie lured Maloney, Nelson and McLennan back to 10 Rillington Place as he had done with his previous victims and gassed them in a similar fashion to Muriel E.D. All three succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning, were strangled with rope and then sexually assaulted as they died. After wrapping the victims in blankets, Reg hid their bodies in a small alcove behind the back kitchen wall, which he managed to hide through wallpapering the area. According to one source, in regards to Maloney's death, Christie got up the morning after he killed her and made a cup of tea, with her corpse still sitting in the chair where he took her life, before placing her body into the kitchen alcove. On the 20th of March, Christie moved out of 10 Rillington Place after fraudulently subletting his flat to a Mr and Mrs Riley. He initially met Mrs Riley and brought her back to the flat. However, unexpectedly, her husband showed up, which caught Christie off guard. After evicting the new tenants the same night they moved in, the landlord allowed the top floor tenant, Beresford Brown, to use Christie's kitchen. Four days later, Brown started cleaning the kitchen due to a bad smell. He then decided to put a shelf up in the kitchen for his wireless radio. However, it was at this point that he discovered a hollow in the wall. Presuming that there was a cupboard behind the wallpaper, Brown peeled it back, only to reveal the secret alcove. He opened the door and shone a torch into the confined space and he jerked back in fright. He was unsure at first what he had seen, but upon closer inspection, Brown realised that he had found a dead woman, her back facing him. Brown had stumbled upon the perfectly preserved bodies of 26-year-old Maloney, 25-year-old Nelson and 26-year-old McLennan. The police were immediately informed, and they then went looking for Reg Christie. The police searched through 10 Rillington Place. A man's suit was found under some floorboards of the common hall area, and a man's tie, tied into a reef knot, was found in the kitchen cupboard, tied in a similar fashion to the tie found around baby Geraldine's neck. Potassium cyanide was also found in the flat. The backyard was searched extensively and several bones, including skulls, were found in several flower beds, under a bush and in a dustbin. Pieces of a burnt dress were also found in this bin, as well as hair and teeth. It was only at this point that the femur bone, found propped up against the fence in the back garden, was noticed. 
Authorities had found the remains of Furst and ED and shortly afterwards discovered Ethel's remains under the living room floorboards. It came to light that Christie had actually a macabre collection of pubic hair belonging to each of his victims in a small tobacco box, but after comparisons, some of the hair was left unaccounted for. Some believe that this means Christie had more victims, possibly during his policing career, but authorities haven't looked into this any further. Others argue that it is unlikely that Christie carried out his crimes anywhere other than 10 Willington Place, but that still leaves the question as to who the remaining hair belonged to. It is possible that they belonged to Edie or Furst, or perhaps prostitutes that Christie photographed, but it is unlikely that we will ever know. Christie stayed at Rowton House in the King's Cross area of London during this time, where he booked a room for seven nights under his real name and address. On March 24th, Christie left the hotel after he heard news regarding the bodies found at Rillington Place and seeing his picture across the front pages of newspapers. He bought a new coat and other clothing items in an attempt to disguise himself. However, authorities eventually caught up with him on March 31st and he was arrested near Putney Bridge. Quite interestingly, in his possession was a number of coins and a newspaper clipping about Timothy Evans being in custody. Upon his arrest, Christie admitted to killing Maloney, Nelson and McLennan, as well as his wife Ethel, but not Ruth Furst, Muriel Eady, Beryl Evans or Geraldine Evans. He later admitted to killing Ruth, Muriel and Beryl, burying their bodies in the back garden. However, he never admitted to Geraldine's murder. It is widely believed that he lied about this so that he wasn't treated badly by other prisoners. Ethel's body was later found under the floorboards in the front room, and Ruth and Muriel's skeletal remains were found in the back garden where Christie had buried them. As a result of Christie's confessions, Timothy Evans was given a posthumous pardon by the High Court, and his living relatives were given compensation for his wrongful execution and miscarriage of justice. Capital punishment cases, including Evans's wrongful death sentence, led towards the 1965 abolishment of capital punishment for murder in the United Kingdom. Shockingly, Reg Christie was only ever put to trial in regards to the murder of his wife, Ethel, in June of 1953 at the Old Bailey. However, he pleaded not guilty by means of insanity. According to fellow inmates, Christie compared himself to the acid bath killer John George Haig, who murdered a number of women. However, it is reported that Christie wanted his murder total to be more than Haig. The doctor who evaluated Christie testified, however, that Reg had a, quote, hysterical personality but was not insane, as he managed to come up with elaborate stories to hide the truth, and only someone of a sound mind would be able to do this. As a result, the jury rejected Christie's plea of not guilty by means of insanity. After 85 minutes of deliberations, Reg Christie was found guilty of murdering his wife, Ethel. On July 15th, 1953, Reg Christie was hanged at Pentonville Prison by the same executioner as Timothy Evans, a man named Albert Pierpont. Justice had finally been served for Ruth, Muriel, Ethel, Beryl, Beryl's unborn son, Geraldine, Kathleen, Rita, Hectorina and, of course, Timothy. Rillington Place itself no longer exists. It was renamed a year after Reg Christie was hanged to Ruston Close. However, the entire street was eventually demolished. Bartle Road, London, is now where Rillington Place once stood but the horrors of what happened there still haunts many to this day. May all the victims of this evil monster rest in peace.